in the heart of Chicago, amidst the hustle and bustle of city life, a powerful force was emerging in the mid-1970s, the Oruckans, a name that would soon become synonymous with both fear and reverence. As the city grappled with economic challenges and social unrest, the Oruckans carved out a niche for themselves. They weren't just another street gang, they were a community force, from organizing neighborhood events to mediating street disputes. They often blurred the lines between protectors and perpetrators. At the helm of this group was Jeff Ford, a charismatic leader with a vision, known to many as Chief Malik. He was a man of contrast. On one hand, he was seen as a beacon of hope, a leader who advocated for the rights of the marginalized. On the other, he was a shrewd strategist, always a step ahead of his adversaries. Under forced leadership, the group grew in numbers and strength. Their operations expanded, and so did their ambitions. As the Elruckans solidified their position in Chicago's urban landscape, they also caught the attention of law enforcement. But for the residents of the neighborhood they dominated, they were more than just a gang. They were a symbol of resilience, unity, defiance against a system that is often seen stacked against them. But before we get into it, it's time for a word from the sponsors of this video, Rocket Money. How many of us have come across a subscription that we forgot we had, or one that we haven't used for a long time? I know I have, especially in today's world, where looking after your money seems more important than ever. It's all too easy to lose track of these sort of things, both big and small and end up paying for months on end for services that we no longer need. Well, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you to cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. I love using Rocket Money to cancel these unwanted and forgotten subscriptions. Instead of having to go through manually, locating and getting rid of them, Rocket Money can safely and securely identify them for me. It even lets me cancel them from within the app with just a couple of taps, no need to worry about the customer service calls. Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 per year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. To try it out today and unlock more features with premium, follow my link, rocketmoney.com 19xx, or click the link in the description to get started for free. And now, back to Jeff Fort and Yale Ruckins. Real quick. Around 97% of all of my viewers aren't subscribed to my channel. If you enjoy the content, please leave a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below. It really helps grow the channel. Thank you. The mid-1970s marked the turning point for Jeff Ford. Incarceration for many is a time of reflection. And for Ford, it was no different. During his time in prison, Fort was introduced to the teachings of Islam. It provided a structure, a sense of purpose, a new direction for his life, and a new vision for his gang. Upon his release, Fort emerged with a new purpose. He rebranded the gang, giving it a name that reflected its new ethos, El Ruckins, an Arabic term meaning foundation. It was symbolic of the new path he envisioned for the group one that was rooted in faith and community service. The Ruckins, under forced guidance, began to incorporate Islamic practices into their daily lives. Prayer sessions became a common sight, and the gang's headquarters echoed with the sound of Quranic verses. However, the shift did not go unnoticed. Law enforcement, already wary of the group's influence, now viewed them with increased suspicion. This new identity, while bringing them close as a community, also set the stage for the challenges that lay ahead. As the Ruckins grew in influence and stature, they inevitably drew the attention of the U.S. government. The 1980s saw a heightened focus on organized crime and street gangs, and the Ruckins, with their unique blend of criminal activity and religious fervor, were squarely in the crosshairs. The government's pursuit was relentless. The Ruckins were under constant surveillance, and in 1983, their worst fears were realized. Jeff Fort, the charismatic leader who transformed the gang, 
and giving it a new purpose was once again behind bars. Determined to dismantle the group from the inside out, the government introduced a new tool in their arsenal, a wiretap on forced prison phone. Every conversation was now laid bare for the authorities. The wiretap provided a window into L. Ruckin's operations, their plans, and most importantly, their connection to larger, more sinister plots. Fort navigated the challenges of prison life, unaware of the extent to which his privacy had been invaded. The wiretap would be a game changer, setting the stage for a series of events that would shake the very foundation of the L. Ruckins and challenge their place in the annals of Chicago history. As the 1980s progressed, the L. Ruckins' ambitions extended beyond the streets of Chicago, reaching across the vast expanse of the Atlantic to the deserts of Libya. The wiretap on Fort's prison phone began to pick up conversations that hinted at a connection far more alarming than anyone had anticipated. Whispers of dealings with Libyan terrorists began to circulate. The Oruckans, it seemed, had their sights set on a global stage. But what could a street gang from Chicago possibly want with a North African nation? The answer lay in Jeff Force aspirations. Inspired by Louis Farrakhan's financial support from the Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi, Force saw an opportunity. If Farrakhan could secure millions from Gaddafi, why couldn't the El Ruckins? With the financial might of a nation behind them, the possibilities were endless. The U.S. government grew increasingly alarmed. The potential threat posed by a street gang with ties to a foreign nation known for its support of terrorism was too significant to ignore. The FBI, recognizing the gravity of the situation, swung into action, devising a plan to ensnare the El Ruckins. They introduced an undercover agent into the group's inner circle, posing as an arms dealer with connections to terrorist networks. The agent offered the gang a weapon of immense power, an M72 series light anti-tank weapon. The implication was clear. This was not just a transaction. It was an invitation to commit a terrorist act on American soil. The El Ruckins, blinded by ambition and the allure of Gaddafi's promised wealth, took the bait. Meetings were held, plans were discussed, and the trap was set. In every conversation, every handshake, every exchange was meticulously recorded by the FBI. The sting operation provided the U.S. government with the evidence it needed to act against the El Ruckins. But more than that, it revealed the extent of the gang's ambitions and the links they were willing to go to achieve them. The line between street crime and international terrorism had been blurred. As their ambitions grew, so did their audacity. Their dealings were no longer confined to the shadows of Chicago's alleyways. They were now operating on an international stage. The next chapter would take place far from the streets of Chicago, in the tropical backdrop of Panama. Word reached the El Ruckins of a meeting, a rendezvous with the Libyan representatives. The promise? A deal that would solidify their partnership and provide them with the resources they so desperately sought. In a Panamanian hotel, a pact was forged. The Libyans representing the interests of Gaddafi made their proposition clear. Commit a terrorist act on U.S. soil, and in return, receive a hefty sum of cash and a supply of cocaine. It was a deal that would seal the El Ruckins' fate. Even as they shook hands with their Libyan counterparts, little did they know that their actions were being closely monitored. Nineteen eighty seven, the year that would see culmination of the US government's pursuit of the El Ruckins. The stage was set for one of the most sensational trials in American history. With the nation's eyes fixed on Chicago's courtroom, from the outset, it was clear that this was no ordinary trial. The atmosphere was thick with tension and anticipation, and as attendees made their way into the courtroom, they were met with metal detectors and state police dogs patrolling the corridors. Amidst his heightened security, it was the El Ruckins themselves who commanded the most attention. Their distinctive attire set them apart a bold statement of their identity and defiance. 
Red fezes adorned their heads, while their bodies were draped in white flowing robes, fur coats, and cornrows. The trial was a media frenzy. Reporters jostled for the best positions, their cameras capturing every moment. The prosecutor's opening statement set the tone. This case concerns organized crime with a twist of terrorism. As the proceedings began, the weight of the evidence against the L. Ruckins became clear. The wiretaps, the sting operation, the meetings in Panama. It all painted a picture of a gang that had overreached blinded by ambition and greed. But as the evidence was presented, they remained defiant. Central to the prosecution's argument was the L. Ruckins' connection to Libya. Through a series of recordings, documents, and testimonies, they painted a picture of a gang that had not only sought financial gain, but had also been willing to commit acts of terror on American soil for a foreign power. The wiretap conversations from Fort's prison phone played a pivotal role. The jury listened intently as Fort's voice echoed through the courtroom, discussing plans, deals, and the promise of wealth from Gaddafi. The recordings provided a rare insight into the inner workings of the gang and their international ambitions. Witnesses were called, each adding another layer to the prosecution's case. Undercover agents recounted their interactions with the El Ruckins, detailing the gang's eagerness to procure weapons and their discussions about potential targets. The testimony from the Sting operation was particularly damning, with agents describing how the group had been willing to purchase an anti-weapon for a terrorist act. But perhaps the most compelling evidence was the account of the meetings in Panama. The prosecution presented a timeline, corroborated by hotel records, flight details, and witness testimonies that placed them in direct contact with Libyan representatives. As the days turned into weeks, the weight of the evidence seemed insurmountable. The El Ruckus once feared and revered on the streets of Chicago were now on the defensive, battling not just for their freedom, but for their very legacy. The courtroom was packed to capacity as the trial neared its conclusion. The jury returned with their verdict. Guilty. The courtroom erupted. A mix of relief, shock, and disbelief. The formidable gang that had once held Chicago in its grips had been brought to justice. The aftermath of the trial was swift and decisive. Key members including Jeff Ford faced lengthy prison sentences. Their assets were seized. Their operation disrupted and their influence on the streets of Chicago began to wane. In the wake of the verdict, questions began to emerge about the conduct of the prosecution. Allegations of prosecutorial misconduct surfaced, casting a shadow over what had been held as a significant victory against organized crime. Rumors of bribes, coercion, and the suppression of evidence began to circulate, tainting the integrity of the trial. As investigations into these allegations deepened, startling revelations came to light. It was discovered that some witnesses, key to the prosecution's case, had been provided with drugs and other favors while in custody. The fallout was immediate and far-reaching. Several L. Ruckin drug cases, previously seen as open and shut, were re-examined. In some instances, convictions were overturned leading to the release of members who had been incarcerated based on questionable evidence. In the aftermath of the trial and the subsequent revelation of the L. Ruckless began to fade into the annals of history, their presence marked by graffiti, gatherings, and the distinct red fences became a rare sight. Other gangs sensing the power vacuum moved in staking their claims and reshaping the dynamics of Chicago's gangland. For the residents of Chicago, the diminishing presence of the El Ruckins was met with mixed emotions. While many breathed a sigh of relief, free from the grip of the gang's influence, others remembered the sense of community and protection they once provided. For all their flaws, they had been a known entity, a predictable force. Their decline brought with it a new era of uncertainty. Today, the El Ruckins exist mostly in memories and stories, a testament to the transient nature of the power and influence. While their legacy is undeniable, 
that once mighty empire is a reminder that even the most formidable can fade, given time and circumstance. As the years pass and the world continues to evolve, the story of the El Ruckin serves as a cautionary tale. It reminds us of the ever-present challenges of urban life, the complexities of global politics, and the thin line that separates ambition from overreach. In the chapters of American history, the El Ruckins will forever be remembered, not just for their crimes, but for the profound impact they had on the nation's psyche.